right? Yes. Yes, you sent that to Anna and me. Yes. Yeah, you sent it to me too. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I'm trying to get a bunch of people who I know are Harbor interested Town is an in all new series from Miniature Building um, Authority. The leader I'm, I'm in more interested. gaming yeah. scene. But I, I ran Flexible into that Harbor Town will list games that had um, how people got their titles. And I know I saw it not less than two or three days ago. But now as to where it is now, so when I did the, um, I, I considered the uh, spheres of influence to be major, major, uh, intermediate, and minimum, okay. as opposed to just uh -huh. major and minor. Major and minor, and but I did major and I did intermediate. So major was you go all the way up to seventh level spells. In, in a, intermediate, you add uh, uh, the other way around. Minimum is one, two, and three. Then four and five is intermediate, and then major goes all the way up to seven. And apparently, I did it on 722, 1986. Nice. I actually put hey. the goddamn date on something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From the so this is like two years after you published the dragon. I have probably. Yeah, because that's 1984. Right, right. Um, luckily, that's written at the bottom of the, uh, the individual pages uh, from the dragon. So we know in that time. Well, I will find it again. I I'm amazed at some of the stuff I've found in searching for, to, to try to, to pin down the movement. And yeah. I got to the point where I'm looking at Dullstrand, which is in uh, Sunday, Sunny, mm -hmm. Sunday, Sunday. Yeah. And it seems to me that if I were going to go to Lend, to Lendor Isle, I would leave from that port because the arrows that you know when it, when it shows the, the, the Sul migration, they don't leave from uh, from the Great Kingdom at all. The uh, arrow goes down through the vast swamp. Oh the Lord knows why. Yeah. Go through the yeah. vast swamp, but it goes down through the vast swamp into a monoland and the the, uh, the uh, Scarlet Brotherhood. But somewhere along the line, there's going to be a line that gets the window out. Now, what I think happened with Darlene, who I love dearly, on her map, she wrote down low Rel Tarma. Yeah. I think what happened was, it used to be in the upper right-hand corner of the island, but she ran out of space on the end of the... Oh. That's so she why that to happened. Pick the goddamn thing up and move it 150 miles. Yeah. And clean it. Mm -hmm. We discussed that on Friday night with uh, Alan Grow and uh, Icarus and all them about that. Well, yeah. So, yeah. I, I yeah, was. I turned it down. I was. I was with Gary. He had the. Uh, I was in his home in Lake Geneva, and he gets out the map and says, "Look at how beautiful this is. It's inaccurate." And I went, "What?" <laughs> We're going to come so, on early because this discussion's already kind of started. How's that sound? We don't hurt yeah. anyone's feelings. Anyway, mm -hmm. yep. uh, yep. I, I have never, ever, ever met Darlene. Uh, I have not. Uh, Hopefully I did, that can I did, happen sometime. I did hold a grudge. <laughs> but, you know, life's like that. So, yeah. Leonard's already started a conversation. So, hey, hello, everyone. And thank you for coming on. I'm Jay, a.k.a. Lord Gazumba. I got some great, this is going to be the, the granddaddy of them all tonight. And I got Brian Blumklotz, who's been on before multiple times. Say hi, Brian. The great Anna Meyer is on. Hey. The great DM Mark is on. And then the legend, I mean, literally a D and d from the beginning legend, uh, 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 mm -hmm. Someone I have look, looked up to since day one, since I've been playing. Since I'm hat covers my halo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, oh, but the, the hat turned around to this. <laughs> yep. 
Leonard, thank you so very much for coming on tonight. This is like a dream come true for me. Yep. I know for Anna too, and for Mark, and probably for Brian, for all of us and all of everyone watching. Yep. Um, this is uh, this is uh, um, an honor. I really appreciate you taking out of your uh, your time to come on here. And we're just going to bounce all over the place. And we this is a celebration for you. We want to talk about all your achievements, some new stuff you you're doing, which is great, right? You're doing some fantastic things, and you got your well, neutral hat in, on, and we are awesome. In, we're ready uh, to roll. In L four and L five, yep. I'm reasonably confident that I took the clergy of at least two gods and embellished it. So if you look at the companion piece, uh, L4 has got three parts to it and L4 has four, Yep, I think. And they're scrolling through right now as we speak. Yeah, so it took forever to get that stuff published. Uh, it was sat on for a large number of years, and then I'm trying to think of the guy who finally rammed it through. Uh, he said to me, you know, uh, L5 has got everything but the kitchen sink, and I said, well, I could make a magic sink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's... But, but, yep. but mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that would have been an injury to insult. But anyway, um, I had... I'm reasonably positive. I took Falcon at least and somebody else and I embellished the clergy. Yeah. And that's in the companion pieces. And the companion pieces list various rulings that I get. Um, I think my signature rulings are one, that magic weapons can be plus one to hit only or plus one to damage only in addition to plus one to hit and damage. Mm -hmm. I did that. And that increases the number of magic items in play. Every one of them is still magic relative to hitting a gargoyle, for example. But the plus one to damage is certainly worth more in the long run because every time you do, in fact, hit, you do an extra point of damage. The one that's plus one to hit only counts one time in 20, where it actually makes the difference of moving the 13 to a 14, so now you hit. So the plus one to hit only is, eh, it's all right, it's nice to have, and if there happens to be a gargoyle around, you can hit. The other really false thing I did, but I decided that early on you had all these arguments about have I stopped this guy from casting a spell? Yes or no? Yes or no? So what I did was, I said, take the middle of every segment, and that's when the blows hit and the arrows land. When you cast spells, you begin them at the very instant of the beginning of a first segment, and then go for as many segments as you have to. Now, it's totally artificial, but, you always know if you interrupt the guy's spell because the spell, the blow or the arrow or the missile hit in the middle of the segment. But since the whole combat system in AD&D is not hit location and it's not meant to be a simulation because after all, one blow in a minute is nonsense. It is unadulterated nonsense, but it is the system we have. And what really blew the shit out of it was when he started doing grappling, pummeling, and overbearing. He went, oh, my God, now you just ruined the whole goddamn thing. <laughs> and then you put in caltrops, and you had caltrops hitting the foot. But no other weapon can hit an exact place. So I said, if you hit a fire to magic missile, and the magic missile always hits, and there's a small hole in a doorway, and you happen to be looking through it, do I hit you in the eye? <laughs> and the answer is no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so only the Caltrop. Only, yeah. Oh, but I didn't do that. I, I said, the Caltrop does damage to you. There it is. Live long and prosper. You know, it, you just can't single out one thing and say it's the exception to everything else. Either you have a combat system or you don't have a combat system. Makes sense. And I have these people all the time keep saying to me, well, there's 
critical critical hits. And we played that for a while. I, I played everything. And, and what ended up happening is you had a paladin missing an eye. His ear was off. Uh, most of his left hand was gone, and he didn't have one leg. Now, that's not heroic fantasy anymore. I'm sorry. It just isn't. So once the players, you start maiming them, they're suddenly going, well, wait a minute. It was fun to see the orc's head go flying off, but now it's not so much fun to see my eye go out. Gee, I don't like that. Well, yep. you see, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I mean, you can't, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. You can't do it to them without them being able to do it to you. Yep. And players don't care for that. Well, uh, yeah, that's true. That's that's yeah. absolutely true. Uh, with a, especially within one e, I mean, that's that's definitely. Uh, it depends on your players too. Some players like the abuse. So, oh, uh, yes. I know. Uh, so, so Leonard, we're going to bounce around a little bit. I, um, I I wanted to ask you this because uh, I don't think we ever discussed this in previous conversation. Uh, how did you meet Gary? And like, um, the, how I, I that relationship could, I could explain that easily. Okay. Um, uh, you were called the uh, the general from Avalon Hill. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So they had various clubs and organizations, and most of them were uh, we kill nothing but Nazis or uh, strange names. And these people were claiming hundreds of wins in play-by-mail uh, games. Because remember, Avalon Hill did play by mail. Yeah. And then there was an organization called the International Federation yes. of War Game. Okay. None of that horseshit. So I said, well, now this might be some sane people. So I joined that. And guess who was vice president? Okay. E. Gary Gygax. Nice, nice. And the president who just, who just resurfaced is Scott Duncan. Um, he was out of my radar for a long time, and all of a sudden he sent me a friend request maybe four weeks ago, five weeks ago. Excellent. Uh, so for a while, uh, Gary worked in downtown Chicago at um, – he was an underwriter for an insurance company, and I will try to remember the name of the insurance company, but – so I worked at a, at a department store downtown, and what I would do is I would hustle my ass across the uh, down about three blocks. I'd go have lunch with him, uh, and then uh, run back to work. So that's how I met Gary Gygax. He taught me how to play shoji, which is Japanese chess. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, but, cool. but the fun yeah. part about Japanese chess was He's, he would say, well, now this happened. So then you do this, and he said, oh, and by the way, I forgot this rule. And after he did that the third time, I said, are you going to give me all the rules or aren't you going to give me all the rules? <laughs> Nice. Give them one at a time. One Every time at you a screwed time. up. One at a time. I, I told you the vast majority, but there are exceptions to things. It's <laughs> like when you play chess and you finally learn there's such a thing called en passant. <laughs> yeah, Because uh, a lot of people don't know that. That if you move, you know, you move the pawn up to it, but the other pawn is sitting right next to it, you can go behind it and call it. In passing uh, and take them out. Take the pawn, the pawn in passing. Yeah. That's awesome. um, but that's how I met Gary. And um, uh, at the time he was vice president and he was, wanted to run Gen Con. Well, it wasn't called Gen Con 1. A convention in Lake Geneva. And... Um, I met Bill Hoyer, and I met uh, what was the other? There was another guy, uh, Terry Stafford, who lived in Chicago. Um, and I think Terry is the one who had me meet Gary at Gary's place of employment. I'm trying to think of the name of the insurance company, but for better or for worse, when Gary left the employment of that insurance company is what brought everything to a boil because now 
Gary had had an occupation and he migrated from, or commuted, from Lake Geneva to Chicago every day. And there was such a line, it was on the Northwestern Railroad. And the reason the, the line existed was that the president of the railroad lived in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So he built a railroad to his front door. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It, it's, it's, it's power. What can I tell you? <laughs> so we would take this commute, and the line was fair in its quality. You'd be bouncing along and go, oh, my life's over! You know, but but then the track would settle down again for a while. So, hey, uh, uh, Leonard, uh, Zudrick920 says it was Fireman's Fund Insurance that Gary worked That could be right. That sounds yeah. correct. That sounds yeah, correct. Pl playing from the world would, had that listed in there, so it's probably correct. Yes, that does sound right. That does sound fireman's fun. So that led Gary into his, now, of course, he had done all of this stuff with, with Avalon Hill Gaming, and uh, he was a World War II buff, and he was, we all know, a polearm buff, and yeah. medieval miniatures and stuff like that. And the uh, at Gen Con 1, one of the big things was there was like 20 some people playing Napoleonics and whoever that guy was, he was renowned in the Napoleonics field. His name, I don't remember, but he kept showing up year after year and bringing all of his people with all of these little Napoleonic figures that had to be painted precisely based on this Prussian unit was colored this way and he they would get it down to the company level that this company was painted this way but that company and, was and you use standard how, how standard small miniature what is it 10 millimeter or 15 uh, or what's the 15 in millimeter is usually yeah. Yes. yeah probably and yeah. Uh, and and they would have a little piece of a little tiny piece of balsa wood with like five figures on it but those five figures would be 50 people or 100 people. Ah, yeah, aggregated. And units. then when yeah. you wiped out 20, you put a little something over the guy saying, well, now we're at 80% of where we were, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Now, I don't think they used dice. What they did to accomplish the, the winning or losing or what have you, well, I think their Napoleonics were in the ballpark of reenactment as opposed to fighting it over again. Oh, cool. So if Napoleon did this and this and that and so and you knew what it was, you now recreated it on this table so that other people could look at it and go, ooh, wow, and various, various things like that. So that was one of the big draws, is for all these people to show up and watch that thing going on. And then you had big sections of Avalon Hill games, and diplomacy was popular at the time. And I remember precisely, it ran one day, it was on Saturday, and we had exactly 99 people, including Gary and I and the people who were running, uh, running game, exactly 99 people. And on Sunday, after we cleaned up the horticulture hall, we play tested the rule set that would eventually become chainmail okay. without the fantasy supplement. Okay. There was no such thing as a fantasy. Mm. So that all goes back to Gen Con one in sixty eight, correct? Because you you I have down here you whatever the issue. Yeah. You were an organizer of Gen Con two in sixty nine. This uh, article says. That's probably not. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And I think Hoyer did it in the next year after. Okay. Now, a lot of people did a lot of things, and I was titular head or honorary head or chief numbskull, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but a lot of other people did a lot of organizing and got it people to actually show up and say, I'm going to run a table of this, and I'm going to run a table of that, et cetera, et cetera. 
So on paper, I did things that I didn't really do. And then Hoyer did that too. Hoyer was was a, was a uh, another World War II buff. Uh, and Tony Morale, he was our, our uh, this fun story, he was a uh, the treasurer of the uh, uh, International Federation of War Games. And his father was a mafioso. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can look it up. Morale, M-O-R-A-L-E. I don't know. Oh, I, I don't father, doubt it. I don't know his father's first name. But uh, we were in uh, uh, Mr. Morale's house when um, the lunar lander landed, and he said, you know, one small step for man. 50 we years. Wow. Yep. Yeah. So it, it there, you know, th there are strange things that, 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 touch our lives and um, IFW was one of those things where I got to meet Gary and we would go up and we would play uh, games on his sand table which he had baseball. now after leaving Fireman's Fund he had to do something and for reasons unknown to God man and I don't know and, and maybe Luke may know um, he decided to be a cobbler a shoe, so a shoe had, repairman or a shoe maker or like, uh, a shoe repairman. He yeah. wasn't. He wasn't. Okay. Um, he wasn't making the shoe. He was repairing. Now all of this equipment was supposed to show up on like Monday or Tuesday. We come over. We set up a board in the basement, and Mark Mark Nidereck, had created all of this, and it took him two hours to, to terrain this whole vast thing. And the guy knocks on the door and says, your machines are here. So we had to go into his basement and dismantle the sand tape, take it all apart. And we had to do it fairly fast because the guy's on the truck and he wants to put it in and install it and test it. So the guy had to sit there impatiently waiting for us to destroy the sand tape. So that was one of the things from, uh, you know, there's this project that's in motion now that, that uh, Luke's involved in is the uh, Dreams in Gary's Basement. It was a Kickstarter. Yep. Yep. And I got interviewed for that. Did you get interviewed for that, Adam? Nope. I tried, I haven't to, heard, tried uh, to get him to do that. Yeah, we had one email back and forth, and then I haven't heard anything. So, yeah. yeah. So I don't know if they're still doing, still doing it. It's a curse. Every time they do a D&D documentary, I've been interviewed for two of them, two of them and, and, and every time they someone ran away with the money or they got sued or, or something. No, 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 happened, I don't, that, yes. yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't so, think so that's going to happen ha having, having me involved in any of it is a bad omen, I think. Ah. So, yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so the, uh, reason, okay. the reason I wanted them to, to interview you is because, of course, you're doing all the maps of uh, uh, boys, boys. I always kind of an answer. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, you call it boys. No, yep. So, uh, boys and girls, you're about to get up. <laughs> me that you know you came along in in Oith's history, and you weren't necessarily in Gary's basement ever, but that's immaterial. You picked up the ball and you ran with it. So it seems to me that would have been a good interview if you ever if you ever get around to it. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the guy's name who came over to my house with his two uh, minions and they had to set up all the cameras and everything. Yeah. Wow. That, it is an experience. Uh, we had to do it in the garage of all places because the lighting would change. The day. We, could, we did this for like four and a half hours. Of wow. Yeah. yeah, it lasted a long, long time. Yeah. And we went through all this different thing. They went through this story of the thing in the basement where they, they, they tear up the sand table. Now, I have no idea. This is coming out as a, a video of some kind, mm -hmm. pieced together. And some of the things he did in the Kickstarter were pictures that I took uh, from, from Gen Con, probably two and three and four. And he also shows a portion 
of Gary's original hand-drawn map of Earth. And it's made in a series of pieces of paper that are glued together. And I think I send that to you, Henry. I yep, think you yep. I, I no, have she it. has yep. one of those. And now that's got the accuracy level that was drawn, hand-drawn by Gary. And that gives you the back door to, well, is this here or is that there? But I imagine that um, uh, Darlene had to have had a copy. There's no yeah, way but it's, there is a lot of difference between them. So I think Gary gave a lot of, of additional orders to Darlene and we have to talk to Darlene about this in, in the future uh, somehow because this is Don't kind know. of... Don't know. Yeah. So it's all kind of I interesting because, was, yeah. All I know is she moved Laurel Tarma and renamed. <laughs> yeah. and, and when Gary was telling me about this, he said, well, you know, what I would love to do is correct everything and recreate the box set, except he had Bunny coming in from Sears and Kmart and blah, 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 to put this on the shelves because he would, it, it was big enough time. There were, we had pictures of the catalog where Dungeons and Dragons stuff was actually in the Sears catalog. Yes. Yeah. Um, yep. So you had to have that stuff ready to go when it was supposed to be ready to go. So, we had her map, and he said, I'm stuck with it. I can't do anything. Uh, I can't have... Now, whether he ever asked her to go back and correct it, unknown to me, I don't know. But he said he looked here, and he looked there, and he looked here, and little things he noticed right away, because after all, he's the one who drew the map in the first place. And a lot of it had to do with cities that were on the coast that didn't look like they were on the coast, cities that were supposed to be uh, on a river but weren't on the river anymore. Yep. That was one of the things that he said happened a lot because I think Darlene liked to put things in the center of Mexico. was the gist of it. Uh, but as I said, never having met the lady, uh, I don't know. Well, Anna's made a lot of changes for the better on that end, so we don't, you know. So. <laughs> well, we, we, there have been a lot of discussion over the years, so I just followed it, and, and there was a lot of forums where they said if it's within a hex or within 50 miles, then it's considered being a, a, a town, a city on the coastline or along the river. So I just made, if it's a big city that is like 10, 15 miles away from or half a hex away from, from the river, I just assumed that the river was wide enough at that spot. So I kind of, sometimes I, I tweak the river back and forth because I have, my map is way more detailed. So I can have more leg room. I can move them back and forth a little bit. So I just adjusted it to what I thought was logical, so to speak. Well, so, and, and Darlene's map is much more representational, and yeah. so mm -hmm. you can it's use it as a guide. And, and but cool. don't think that that is like a you know a modern GPS-driven topographical yeah, no. map. No, yeah. I see it as one of these yeah. beautiful Let's medieval maps. Rivers. Her rivers yeah. go through the center of, of Hexagon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking at her map right now, and yeah, yeah. that's where her rivers went. Yeah, so they didn't hug the end of hexagons because I've seen maps like that too. But this went through hexagons, through the center of hexagons, almost always. Here and there, it kind of hugs the edges, but that, that's rare. Most of the time, it went through hexagons. So Leonard, I have a question for you about the early days in development of D&D. So you play tested Chainmail before the fantasy supplement was added to the back end of it. That's the Gen Con 1. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously they added the fantasy supplement. So when Gary was developing with Arneson, what was the, the original box set? When were you involved in that? When did you see it first? And you know, what was your thing? Not a damn thing. Not a damn thing. No. He, uh, Arneson came along, and to my knowledge, the earth shaking question that Arneson had was well, the original chain mail, the, the supplement, had fighters of various types, mm -hmm. and then you had heroes and superheroes. 
And Arneson asked the simple question was, how did Charlie get to be a hero? And how did that hero get to be a superhero? Well, now that opened the door to, well, he must have gotten a promotion. He must have gone to from this to this to this to this. This is why you had veterans and warriors and named things for all these people. And hero was number four and superhero was number eight. The names given in um, uh, the original AD&D. &D. Mm -hmm. uh, each one of those things had a name. Oh, the class levels. Class level. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, cool. Just like, cool. Just like all the magic users had. That's where it came and, from. And nice. That's good. To, and, I did not know but, that. But with the clerics and with the magic users, of course, you were grabbing names because he got out his thesaurus and looked up wizard, and then it had all of these things that are magic oh, user life. <laughs> so one of the names is necromancer, and it had absolutely nothing to do. With, yeah. with necromancy in the classic sense. And you had a cleric that's called a llama. Well, that's from the specific religion on earth where they're called llamas. But he threw it in because he needed a name. But the, interesting. the, the stuff from um, fighters was a pretty good name progression. And when you wanted to explain and teach the game to somebody, you would say, it's like private, private first class, corporal, sergeant. Mm -hmm. Except you're calling it something else. Right. So that you let somebody understand by using the military analogy of why this, these things are happening. Now, how do you go from one to two? Well, what if um, there was some barometer, which is the awarding of experience points? So now you start setting these plateaus that led you from zero to 1999 or zero to 2000, you were a veteran, I think. Then you became a warrior, and then you became a swordsman, then you became a hero, then you became a swashbuckler, then a myrmidon and a something and a superhero. Yeah, then Lord. Yeah. That's where all that shit came from. And mm -hmm. while interesting, first to second, there were increments of 2,000 and 2,000. Then all of a sudden it jumped by 4,000. And everybody who had purchased the thing were going, shit, I've got to earn double the amount to just go up <laughs> one level. Yep. And then I've got to earn double that amount to go up another level. Oh, my God, how are we ever going to do that? So the big artificiality in Dungeons and Dragons is when you're designing this stuff, you have to create an obstacle for the party that the party has some remote chance of accomplishing. Because if the opponents are all wizards, literally wizards, 11th level, and superheroes level eight, and the party is first, second, third level, it's not going to go very well. So you're taking them from place to place to place. Now, when I did when I did uh, Lendor Isle, we started in Reston, and then we moved around. But each town was a little bit more difficult than the next one. And you had to design that way, because if you didn't, the party either would walk in and kill everything, or the party would be killed down to the last person. So you've got, you've got this juggling thing going on with that. And you had to have a situation where if the party just broke into the temple and attacked, you'd have total party kill. I mean, no ifs, ands, or buts. So what they had to do was learn how to incrementally attack castles and temples and major things and then run off, cure themselves up, and run back. And the advantage the party had was the cleric. You had preferably two clerics at least, and he's dishing out these damn cures, but the orcs and the goblins and the da 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 don't have the equivalent character that can repair those people. The party's punch is the cleric. 
And realization, you have to realize that it's not based on fires, it's not based on magic, it's not based on thieves. It all centers around the good old magic cleric. And the cleric versus the, the um, mage, the mage has to sit with the goddamn book in the lighted room, doesn't he? And sit there and read the blasted spell. And, and he has to do it every damn time. The cleric, on the other hand, gets on his knees. It can be pitch black. He prays to his God and he gets the spell anyway. And he doesn't have to worry about misreading the spell. Or do, we did that too. We used to say, well, what if you mispronounce the name? Ooh. <laughs> See, that was the equivalent of critical hit. That was the magic user screwing up the spell. Yeah. Yeah. So we played that too. And wow. the player said, but I cast Butterball 18 times. Why did I screw up that one? Well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> was it a problem even back then that uh, wizards were so underpowered at low level and then they were basically oh, yeah. it, useless? It, it, well, it, you literally had to keep this poor slob alive. Yeah. You really could cast Fireball and Lightning. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Now, okay, so that was a phenomenon you, back then, too. Okay, good. Now, all of a sudden, he became an asset. But <laughs> when, when he went along for one to two and three and four, you went, hey, Yeah, we had them to guard horses the first and Look at levels. all the experience points we're throwing into the hopper to get him, to get him moving along. <laughs> so you took him along, and you cast sleep, you opened the door, <laughs> but you found out there's zombies behind it, and now all of a sudden, that <laughs> didn't work. So, but that's what the magic music was good for. You cast a sleep spell, and then you hit him somewhere and protected him. But when you're out in the open and you're getting attacked in the open, that was the thing. You know, when I started doing that to my, to my party, well, you know, you, you move from city A to city B, you can get attacked. And they said, wait, we're going from dungeon to dungeon. I said, no. Really? You have to, able to get to the dungeon, don't you? Uh, um, no, yes, <laughs> so you're gonna roll random encounters. Random so, encounter was born, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, then it started. Then they started saying, Well, he rolls every four hours, so if nothing happens in the first hour, we're safe for three hours. I caught them at that the first time they foolishly said it out loud. Oh, <laughs> we're gonna have to bury them. No, 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 I said. You, you you said, you opened your mouth and you said to me, if nothing happens in hour number one, we're safe all the way to hour number four. So we can do this stuff, this and this and this and this and that, because we can get away with it. No, I think we're going to have to change that. <laughs> then I would roll for the minute within the hour that it would happen, as opposed to it all, everything begins at the beginning of an hour. Yeah, man. But all of that. Early days. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, because the yeah. first three books said a bunch of things and didn't explain a goddamn one of them. How do you train somebody? Tell me. Yeah. How do you go from first to second and have somebody help you? Yeah, you had to have trainers. That was the, the original yeah. first. Yeah, but where did they come from? That's where it. were they? Yeah, Matt, you know, yeah, that's a good question. All that that yeah. stuff, like it says, details to be worked out by the DM in a lot yes. of the Dungeon Master's yeah. Guide. Yeah. Um, so they would come yeah. out of the dungeon, and Wink and Blink and Nod would just happen to be walking by. Well, that was nice. We always had to go to the big city or, or up on the. Oh no, I, I, I brought, the, the I, I, I brought it to them, and <laughs> then I finally said, "No, it should be in town, shouldn't?" It? And of course, That's great. what players do is once they discover they can be raised from the dead, and once they discover where that good high priest is, it becomes like an in and out. You know, every time one of them gets killed, well, here's the stiff, go ahead and raise him. So then I started saying, well, you know, tell me how he died. Well, what do you need to know that for? Well, I want to see if he is worth being raised. What do you mean? I'm paying you $5,500. That's awesome. So, so Len, I, I have a quick question for you about your Lender Isles campaign. Yeah. Uh, when did you start that? Do you remember what year it was that that campaign began? And was that in Chicago or was that somewhere yeah, else? Yeah, oh, yeah, Chicago. Um, 
it's got to be in the 70s somewhere. Uh, the, all we had were the three books, of course, and then Greyhawk came after that. And then... Um, so Lenders uh, Isle was, your, it was basically your dungeon, essentially, on your, the island. Yeah. Yeah, your own well, campaign. It wasn't even on the damn island. It, it's when I went to Gary's house and he showed me the hand-drawn map and said, where do you want to put your adventures? Oh. And I looked at it and I said, well, I don't know. Uh, what's this island over here? He said, it's yours. <laughs> oh, so the uh, islands were there already. Were, were the shape of the, the islands the, the, there? The that... shape of the island was there. And I said, oh. I could make this work. That's awesome. I could make this work. And so that was the, the genesis of your campaign. Right. The, the. Cool. Well, actually, I had run Restonford and the next city over and another couple of other cities. All of that was in the, in the cannery. And in L5, they go to Croton. That was one of the last things they did before I moved from Chicago to, to California. And we did that over oh my God, six years, seven years, eight years. Yeah. And at, at the end of that time, we, were, we played once a week. And when it got to be really crucial, sometimes we played two or three times a week. Roughly four hours every time. Uh, maybe 46, 47 weeks out of the year. Because, you wow. know, yeah. it happened. Yeah. It's about like us. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. And through all of that, I got one character, a halfling, which we all call the Hobbit. <laughs> one halfling got the 16th level. Oh, that wow. one character. So when I started running into people at conventions that were 13, 14, and 15, and say, I got a 22nd level lord. What do you think? I said, you're full of bullshit. <laughs> Shock and awe. I mean, how can you say that? I said, well, I run this campaign. I run it very tight. And I now and then been a little bit generous with a few experience points, but precious little. And it took me all of this time to get one character to 16th level. Don't yeah. tell me you're at 22nd level. What you did was you went into a dungeon and you gave everybody a full level. That's what you did, didn't you? Um, um, well... <laughs> Now and then, we'll see, but now when you're going from fourth to fifth and fifth to sixth and sixth to seventh, my God, you're passing out experience what points like that. You're not going through the gymnastics of assigning the experience points. You're just saying, you went through this tougher dungeon, now you're a level higher. And that's what the kids were doing. So that's how they, the kids Monty got the 22nd level. Yeah, more. exactly. And, I think and we you'd all go there. You'd go there and you'd talk to two different kids, and each one had the wand of orcas. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we've all been in that, that face in our gaming, I guess. Yeah. 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 yeah, we just. Yeah. Everybody's done Monty Hall. I yeah, mean, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was bad about that. I, you know, <laughs> it took a long time for somebody to finally get a sword that was plus two. You get a plus one sword or a plus one axe. And what would piss them off would be, you create your character, and I have someone who is going to be your mentor. And now it may be your father, he might be a fighter, and he could show you the beginnings, of, and, but then you'd have somebody else who was higher level, and that person knew how to use a longsword. Guess what? You got taught how to use a longsword. You go in the dungeon, you find a magic sword. It's a broadsword, sweetheart. Because I designed the dungeon long before I knew you were going to use a longsword. And I refused to change it. Good. I unadulterated refused to change it. I wrote it as a broadsword. You don't know how to use a broadsword. Minus two. Compensated by the fact that it's magic. And now you've got to take an entire level and use that weapon and become proficient with it. I don't like that. Well... <laughs> This is before the days of specialization, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, yeah, specialization was, you know, that was another tomahawk that somebody threw at it. Another Thurkane. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Specialization was, uh, was um, in, an ep in, in addition to. And then you had double specialization. And I didn't like the way specialization went. And I played it for a while. And I said, 
this whole nonsense about you get two blows every other round. Now, I realize there's a whole mess of artificiality in here, but that really seemed to be artificial. Why didn't you get two blows in round one, round two, and round three, and then in round four, one and one? Why not? So I said, when you become proficient, let's say you're at second level, and you went from first to second and you used the weapon the whole time, and your mentor was already a, a specialist. He had to be a specialist to teach you to be a specialist. So I said, none of this two blows every round, you have a 10% chance of getting two blows every round, world without end. And when you go to the next level of specialization, it goes up to 20, and then 30, and then 40, and then 50. And then still, when you went from first level to seventh, where you got the Christmas present of two every other round, yeah, I added too. that in at that point. So that's how I did specialization. Oh, I still do specialization. Um, so this was when you transitioned into AD and D from the original set. Yeah, with the camera. Well, what Gary did was send me the manuscript for the player's handbook and the dungeon master guide, and it yeah, was that's a great story. You know, literally a stack of paper that had to be five to six reams of paper, double space. <laughs> it took me two weeks of doing nothing other than that and eating, sleeping, and going to work to get through the whole thing. And then I would send in, well, this is what I think is, could use a little bolstering. And here's something that I did. And when, when I would tell my party, this is the ruling I'm going to make based upon the fact that we ran into this conundrum. So now I'm going to type it up for you and give you a carbon copy. Remember carbon copy? Oh, yeah. Yep. No. Or the so purple I would stuff give them a carbon yeah, copy. And I would also carbon Gary Gaga because I knew he was working on the upscaled version of Dungeons & Dragons. Now, since I took all of that paper and threw it away, I mean, what do I need it for anymore? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the historian in me, Leonard, just built and died. <laughs> <inside>. <laughs> so, I mean, the player's handbook was written. My, my, my big success, I think, my single big success was a tiny one. And that tiny one was if you threw a whole person on somebody. Yeah, way to hear this. They had to make a system shot. Oh. I caught Gary out of doing that. Sure. I said, because now if you get three clerics, and all three clerics throw a whole person on the high priest, and he fails one of the three, He's dead. he dies. So now a third level cleric, in, in, in essence, casts little finger of death by going whole person, whole person, whole person. And he said, oh, you're probably right. Yeah, well, Everything Carlos may do it now, so you never know. I'm just kidding, and Carlos. Win an argument, but that was what I considered that to be my big argument was that one. And then, of course, I got the player, the uh, Dungeon Master Guide, which was the other thing. I've got pages inside the Dungeon Master Guide, paragraphs here and pages there, without and any I, credit, too, you, right? You did I all this. Yeah. Which ones they were? Oh, yeah. But Lord, I can't because all of that paper went in and out and in and out and back and forth and everything. Right. Um, so you're so you're we, all over the the player's I, handbook and the dungeon master's guide. All over the place like, is your influence. Just like they used to say in big cities in the 30s, the horseshits everywhere. <laughs> Do you remember when I was a little boy? We still had horses going up and down the alleys collecting rags and and debris <laughs> and what have you. Just so when you walk down the alley, there was horseshit. In there. Those are the days. <laughs> so, oh man! So, speaking of old old content not being destroyed, mm -hmm. Leonard sent Anna and myself a whole bunch of stuff just recently, mm -hmm. including yep. this gem. So, uh, I know Brian wants to talk. Why don't we talk about the Sully's deities a little bit, and and like what you did with this missing deity as well? And uh, so, Brian, what was your question you wanted to talk talk about with the Sully's? Well, 
So there's the published version that we all got in that series of articles you wrote for Dragon Magazine. Mm -hmm. And then I got a chance to tonight, just before we got online here to do the show, I got to see the you know your your expanded information on the Sol Louise Pantheon, plus that beautiful typed document you had that was obviously the early draft mm -hmm. of the Pantheon. Now that just to clarify, that was your Pantheon. Correct. Uh, okay. Right. So here's his flow in, chart. In, in, a flowchart. Yeah. In, in, so in yeah, and that flowchart's been flickering across the screen. So in the Dragon Magazine, Lender is the father of all the deities except for Cord, who is the oh. son uh, in oh, Dragon. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The other yeah. Cord is because Cord is the swashbuckler and the womanizer, and if, right. if the female right. will do it. Right. And so, but but Cord is the the son of Cerule and uh, Phaeton, or Phaeton. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in Dragon. But I noticed you had on this lender, uh, the, this lender, the the excuse me, the genealogy of the the Sulpantheon that you show us. I'm keeping it right there. There you go. Yeah, there is this. It, it, it's chart. it's it's uh, it's you say Ouija. It's I, I've always pronounced. Oh it Ouija. yeah, yeah. Well, well, we're, well we're, pronounce we're it. Gonna to, yes. The, we're gonna it. Have to, well, we're well, gonna have to talk well, about the, that. The the game, the game Ouija was originally made by Parker. Remember Parker Brothers? They did uh, Monopoly. They did Sorry. They did Clue, and they also um, did the Ouija board. And it was meant as a game. And there were people who you know went, "Ooh, yes, A G O M. What does that spell? I don't know." I did the... But that was the Ouija board, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. said, well, how can I get the same thing accomplished? So I went we, W E E, and then we G, J A S. So I said we G. The J A S from O U J A S, and the we for O I. O I? O -I. How would you spell we G? O, -O, 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 o U I G A J A S. O U I J A S. So that's where we came from. Yeah. I thought, it, it, you know, God of Magic. Well, Seems perfectly logical to name it after a Ouija board, but I can't use Ouija because Parker Brothers will come to my home and burn it down. So I had to sneak it in through the back door. Well, you also looked, if you saw at the list this morning, yep. you saw where I named the god Oberon originally, and then mm -hmm. Gary flipped it and made it Naribo. Yep. And then then I took uh, a grill, which yep. turned out to be a monster in one of the monster manuals. And he mm -hmm. said, well, let's flip it around and make it lurk. And then I just noticed today that I had named Cyril Cyrock originally. Yes. In these notes here. And I had lost track of that one. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I. and then he put it in um, the world of Greyhawk, listed all those gods that I created, and then eventually fleshed out. He changed very, very little of the stuff that I wrote. What bothered me, but it was after the fact that it was too late, is he put in the standard powers of deity. And I would have liked that to be different for the Sewell gods as opposed to the Iridian gods as opposed to, I would have liked it to not be standard for the planet of, of, of Oit. I wanted it to be standard for the Pantheon. But it was already in print. So I can't do anything once it's in print. Well, so, yeah. so, so, so you, when you conceived of the Sewell Pantheon, you mm -hmm. had this much more complicated relationships. So Ouija and uh, Buckleon were Cord's parents in your conception of it. That changed, obviously, in Dragon. And then Lender was the parent of everybody else. Yes. Uh, oh, well, and, six, in, 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 in Dragon. But you have a completely different genealogy of those gods, yeah. as, as you can see up on the screen here. So was that something you developed? This is your original conception of it? Or was this something that you were doing post the Dragon articles just for your own? Well, I, I had to, at some point, figure out who did what to who and who produced what. What was... What was the level one series of gods and the level two series of gods? Mm -hmm. uh, 
for those of you who read the Belgarian, how many hands? Belgarian, David Eddings? No, no I have actually read, not read that. Yeah. Oh, my God, guys. This is better than Lord of the Rings. Oh, then, yeah. B-E-L-G-A-R-I-A-D. -E I started Belgarian. reading it way back when, but I, I remember never finished it. But that, I think, yeah, I'm not sure yeah, well, if that was it's a Spanish a, it's translation a or the original it's English. A yeah. But, um, it was a marvelous, marvelous book with wonderful character development. He develops a party. Um, uh, and he he develops the gods. And, and you had seven gods. And they were the common known gods to everybody. And it turns out the father of all the gods was this one god named O, I think, U-L. But it wasn't common knowledge that he was the father of all the gods. Within the the world of the Belgarian, with the Bel Belgareth is the head sorcerer who is seven thousand years old, and his daughter is five thousand years old. I guarantee you, you pick it up, you won't put it down. Okay, cool. I appreciate that. And then after it, he did yeah. another one yeah. called the Melorian, which uses the same characters. But I think the Malorian is weaker than the Belgarian. The Belgarian is the one to read. Okay. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration for this, this pantheon that you were doing then? Well, I, what I wanted was someone who produced a round of other gods. And then I said, well, why don't those gods get together and produce another tier of gods? Mm -hmm. So Lendor is responsible for the first Six gods. I think it's six. Yeah, Falcon. Now, I didn't. Egypt. I didn't go into the fact of who is the mother of the gods. I just let that go right by. I said I'm not going to address it. I'm just not going to. I'm not going to say who. All you know is there are six gods that came from Lendor, quote unquote. Six or seven. Not six. Like Falcon. Ouija. Osprim, Zerbo, Cerule, and Dorobo. All right. Yeah, Doribo is old bronze spelled backwards. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's, uh, so, that's cool. Okay, so so uh, actually two questions that spawn off of this. So, and, and this ties into something that Carlos was asking in the chat is, was the Sul Pantheon, was the god you were using in your campaign, correct? Yes. Okay, was the idea of the Sul Empire something that you developed, or was that something no, Gary? That was all Gary. Okay. Yes. Okay. The so back Looney and all that other stuff. So he took this idea of a Sul Pantheon and made a complete cultural background for it in his campaign world. Okay. That okay. That did something with the Sul, and then I'm, I know I did. The, I know I named the gods. I'm, I'm absolutely unadulterated and positive that I named all those gods. And then yeah. he put them in the in the uh, the box set. So, uh, by the way, I just yeah, I just want to also uh, talk to you about one other piece. So, I was rereading re through the gods that were listed in the box set, mm -hmm. and I noticed Osprim was left off the list. It could be. She, yeah, she actually appears first in L two, the Assassin's yes, Not. She does, yeah. and which was surprising me because everyone, I, you know, everyone just assumes that she was in that list, but you know. Uh, you know, Zerbo's there, but Osprim for some reason didn't make the list in the original box set. Yeah. And it was just oh, a weird... Or Sue somewhere along the line. Yeah, yeah. How do you I pronounce that, it? Leonard? Aquaman. How do you pronounce it? Is it Aqu Aquaman? Aquaman. <laughs> Aquaman. <laughs> because I don't want to get sued by the people who created Aquaman. Yes. <laughs> is that Marvel? Is it Marvel or is it uh, mm. DC? Aquaman's DC. Let's yeah. tell everyone out who's watching that we have Leonard's original script on Aquaman right here that he gave us. And this is from a dot matrix printer, obviously. And then we also have Leonard's up recent today. Up today. As today. of today Not on this day, Aquaman. Aquaman. Aquaman is the uh, a son of, uh, of, of Osprey and Zerbo. And uh, why don't you describe him a little bit, Leonard? Because I know a lot of people won't understand well, this. I, I, you know, at, at first when I wrote it, uh, I wrote him to look like a storm giant. Okay, but he's not. But that didn't mean he was a storm giant. Right. 
And when I just did that rewrite, I said that he, as a as a person, he he enjoys walking around doing the whole big thing. You know, here I am, I'm a giant. But he can reduce himself to the size of a human being if he wants to. He's God, after all. So he can do that sort of thing. That allows a little bit more freedom as opposed to having it look like a misshapen peanut gallery uh, when you look at all of them in the body. <laughs> Uh, uh, now, yeah. the, the, the Sewell Pantheon adopted Tiamat and Bahamut. Yes. I'm assuming Tiamat and Bahamut may be in other pantheons. Clearly, the two of them are lesser gods. Clearly, they are. They have to be. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. in power. Um, so... I figure that, well, let's adopt them in the Sewell Pantheon, add them in. So that brings the total to 19. I have seen other gods who belong to the Sewell Pantheon that I've had nothing to do with because it's other people writing after Gary lost the company. Right, right. So as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> that's not good stuff. Right. But there we go. I'll have them scroll through all no the deities now. That. That went along its merry way, and there was absolutely nothing you could do about it. Because other people wrote those various things, like they did the, uh, what was it, the Greyhawk Wars, right? right. Yeah. And that's where the, the Card the, Sergeant. The yeah. Well, that was Zeb Cook that we were letting Oh, sorry, up. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Somebody get me involved. I mean, somebody. I mean, there were there were high priests. There were gods. I mean, who are, the, who are these elves? Screw them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the great thing about this deity, Aquaman, is it fills, fills a hole, Mark. God of storms, which we remember we had to oh, create one, yeah. right? Exactly. Chaotic neutral with good tendencies, um, and uh, son of Zerbo and Osprey in a good relationship with both. He's on good terms with Jasker, Falcon, and Cord. He and Lurg do not always see eye to eye. So Leonard has an in review, so we can't release this yet to anyone, an in review list of this. But oh, you can release it to whoever you want. You sure? Want to... Okay. Well, I was thinking that you should publish this in the New Earth Journal 30. Uh, get with Icarus, who's on right now, and, and put it in the New Earth Journal 30 when it comes out. Well, yeah, 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 but, but I need eyes to look at it. No, I'll we'll take yeah. it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, and, uh, add, we'll all look at it for you. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. I, I, I admit to the classic thing about proofreading. I can't proofread my own stuff. I'm atrocious at it because I know what I meant to say. So since I know what I meant to say, that must have been what I said. Yeah. But it isn't. I well, leave out verbs. I leave out articles. All, I leave out adjectives. All four of us. I know what I meant to say. Yeah. All four of us will look it over and get it back to you with if we need an edit or whatever, and then we'll get it out to everyone because I can do content people are I'm starving on vacation for. August 9th, and I, I probably will do nothing uh, until I get back from that. Okay, cool. 11 or 12 days. Now, so, uh, I only uh, did the rewrite of Aquaman because I knew we were going to do this today. So I said, well, wait a minute. You know, as I read through it, I said, it's, it's too brief. So I've embellished a number of things in there that aren't in the original type piece. There's a number of things there that weren't there. Um, um, you've got uh, Aquaman being a 14th level cleric, 14th level druid, 20th level fighter, fight, yeah. which is the original. Well, that means he can cast all those spells, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, so anyway... Uh, I decided to, uh, to to bring him out of the shadows and put him back in where he belonged. But I also sent you the documentation, which he says the type piece of paper. He's at the bottom of that. He's there. Yes. So it's not as if I created him now. So, well, Larry, I created him all those years ago. Well, Larry's talking about this that uh, exactly. Brian Anna and I have. Okay, uh, it has a listing of all his gods of all the different. Things and here's Aquaman, and then there's uh, there's Bahamut and Tiamat, Tiamat there, so they're all yeah. here. And I, we got I some great because, data. Uh, I did, did that because I was running a campaign in Radic, so you'll notice that it says churches in Radic and types uh, and churches in the uh, barbarian states. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So that's but see, it doesn't go to who's on Lendor Isle. 
It doesn't go into who's in the monoland. It doesn't go into who's in the Scarlet Brotherhood and who's in these various places where uh, there's, there's a, um, you ever see one of these Westerns where a bunch of people get in there with their wagons and they're all lined up. And what they're doing is they're riding out into the wilderness and sticking their claim. And that's how they created their homestead, right? Yeah. My favorite guy was the guy who let them all go, 80 wagons. He took his wagon, he moved it 20 feet and said, here's my homestead. <laughs> yep. Boom. He was my favorite guy. I, I, you know, I thought, well, gee, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, anyway. We're getting we're getting a boatload of questions from the audience. I think we should take a yeah. couple. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I ask one question about the Sul Pantheon first, and then yeah, sure, we'll absolutely, it up? absolutely. So, Leonard, I noticed. So you, you in your campaign, said in Radic, you were bringing uh, Tiamat and Bahamut into the the Pantheon. Yeah. Horde has a kill all dragons on sight kind of background. You know, he he's or his sword at least thirsts for the blood of dragons. Yeah. It could uh, be. Yeah. Bahamut's is an exception. Ex okay. Because Bahamut so, will disintegrate his ass. <laughs> <laughs> but, so my question is, was there a relationship in your mind between the Sul Pantheon and the dragons in terms of, like, you know, what, it, what was their relationship, I guess? It, it, is, you know, were they hostile? Well, was it indifferent? Well, well, remember that Bahamut is written to often be a human. He'll appear mm -hmm. as a human. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. in the history that we that, that uh, uh, Steve Wilson and I wrote way back, we took his original uh, calendar and we did the Sewell version of, of it. And I sent that to you guys recently. Yeah. And I noticed there was a, a it's not a mistake, it's uh, an oversight. And that is that somewhere in year 1734 on the Sulu calendar, he talks about Lendor Isle. Well, he can't because Lendor Isle has become Lendor Isle until the Sulu move in. They named it after the head of the pantheon. So you can't have Lendor Isle in 17 something when no, none of the Sulu are sitting on the damn isle. Just a small little thing. Uh -huh. Some nuances there that uh, nuances. can be fleshed out. Absolutely. Nuances. So open it up, Jay. It's uh, um, first question. I don't want to. I, I know that there's if there's something that we go off on, it's a little that gets you. I know this one may get you a little bit, but uh, Carlos asked the following. I know. I know you're paid ten thousand, like roughly ten thousand five hundred for three modules, and right. here they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Secret of Bone Hill is on our wall of fame, by the way. And then you got Assassin's Eye, you got Deep Dwarven Delve. I know Deep Dwarven Delve, you were a little, you were a little upset about some of the edits in Deep Dweep Dwarven Delve. The Deep Dwarven Delve. That was the question. Went into a filing cabinet and stayed there for approximately twenty years. Right. And then they were bringing out the box set, and they said, "What have we got laying around?" And the twenty-fifth anniversary edition silver box set we're talking about. Right. So now, I, they sent me, well, here's your manuscript. Someone from TSR, and I swear to you, I don't remember who. The two of us got together and I said, well, let's update it. I mean, 20 years have gone by since I wrote the damn thing. So let's update this for this and update that for that and update this for that. We agreed to send it off to them. They lost it. Now, they then took it and they edited it okay. for the way they wanted it to go. So a good solid 20 to 25% of the Deep Door of Mandel is not me. Okay. okay. It's editors from TSR who are probably listed in the credits. Probably. That's not, some of that's not me. Well, I know Chris Perkins did the maps on it, which was surprising to me. It didn't, didn't really strike me as a map guy, though I've seen him <laughs> draw maps before. Um, I drew the maps, and 
the interesting story on that is these were a bunch of people who attack rest and train. And they killed off a bunch of people. And we produced a map of the year 575, which shows Restonford before, and 576, which shows Restonford after. Mm -hmm. And then 577 shows Restonford after it's rebuilt. And um, Ron, Ron, I think his last name is Kelbrick. Ron Kelbrick. He did many maps for me. And uh, a guy who's uh, Andreas Claren, who is in Germany, I think. Yep. Um, and Sir something like Sir Clarence, maybe. He did a lot of the uh, maps of inns and other things for me. And then uh, Ron has been doing stuff for me lately. They, 575, 576, 577, some of those maps came from Ron. Now, what point was I going to make about that? Well, that, uh, the, the, you know, the maps were all, uh, you know, of, of different origin, which is cool. Yeah, I but anyway, it was but a mess. 576, but, uh, when they attacked, yeah. they now rush back to where they were. Well, where they were is where the Deep Dwelven Dwarf is. Delve is. Mm -hmm. But it was obvious they went in when they went after the the remains of the people who survived the attack on Restonford. Restonford was too strong for them to crack with the, I don't know, was one or two hill giants and a bunch of ogres and Restonford couldn't crack based on on that attack. So a bunch of them ran away. And they commissioned a party to go after the, these people and see where'd they go, what information can we get? And we took, when I played it for real in my campaign, there is a bard sitting in Restonford. A bard, which is edition one bard, not the current incarnation bard. The fighter thief bard. So he came along for the ride and I tried to as subtly as I could subtle, as subtly as I could possibly say, if you have him do all the work, he gets all the experience. <laughs> if nice. he does all the work, he gets the experience. For him. Let me repeat that a third time. <laughs> <sighs> if you keep relying on him all the time, you're gonna have a problem. But I felt as though they needed somebody with a fairly decent background. Now, if you recall, the bard was a fifth through eighth level fighter and a fifth through eighth level was a druid or thief, whatever the hell it is. Uh, thief and then with druid spells. Uh, and then, yeah. he, then he starts learning druidical spells, yeah? Yep, yep. So when you take that guy along for the ride, he is a fifth through eighth level fighter. Whatever, whatever I said he was, relative to his various levels that made him such and such a level of bar. He was that kind of guy. So he went along to do the Deep Dwarven Dwell. Well, they had at least one dwarf and at least one gnome. And the minute they get to the place where the delve is and they discover the front door and they go around and discover the back door and they get to look at it and they go, oh, this is Dwarven construction. Who else could build this? The, uh, the orcs don't have the skill to build this. It's dwarven. Oh. So now you've got a series of rooms that one leads in from the back door and one leads in from the front door. And they go blasting their way in and they get to a certain room where there's a bunch of pallets where the orcs slept. Now remember, many of the orcs aren't there because they've just been killed over in Restinger. But a bunch of the pallets were opened un under it so that the orc could go under his own bed and close the thing and set off a trap when the people walked in. And then he had a magic user who went up a, a staircase that had a window overlooking the room. And of course, he would fireball the whole damn thing because he didn't care if he killed the orcs. What did that matter to him? He didn't care. So they go and they do that. They conquer that room. And it was the end of the session. 
And now they start hearing the rest of the orc coming through one panel passageway and more orcs coming through the other passageway and they're beaten up. And they end the session right there. And I said, well, I can't have it in this way. <laughs> Why don't I put in a door that goes down? That's where the deep door and Del came from. They ended up in that room, whatever the hell that room was. And once the, let's see, I think I might have it here. Maybe, maybe. maybe no. It's cool. Mm -hmm. It's cool yeah. just to hear the story about it. Oh yeah, this you is know, I, I just yeah. it's, it's well, well you see you have to wing this shit. <laughs> <laughs> we all do as DMs. Yeah, let yes. us, we all do. <laughs> at one point or another. <laughs> what what party has ever like stayed yeah. on the rails ever? Yeah. yeah. Ever. <laughs> Here. Okay, so Deep Dwarven Delve. Yeah, there we are, and it is room number five, I think. No, four. So five is the big room with all the people hiding under the, 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 the pallets, and you'll notice there's an opening overlook. Central there, I got it, yeah. Room. Yeah. Now they go down to room number four, yeah, the and now people are coming from room number two, and more people have gone through room three, back through five, and are coming down towards four. And they're very beaten up from having recovered from five. So I went and I said, you know, they don't have any time to cure themselves. There's no way they could get all that done. So I said, well, the the sword that the bard acquired, let's see now. I, mean, I gotta get this right. They I, had something I look for the that bird. detected secret doors and or the dwarf went and said, well, there's a door right there. Uh, so he goes over and goes mumbo jumbo, mumbo jumbo, where is it? You know, and he gives a hand, oh, there it is. And it opens. And he goes in and closes the door behind him. But now they're behind the door and now they're starting to go down into the deeps stuff which is where the evil dwarves are. And they run into Ooh. them as they go down and spiral down. It's a great module, end. and if you never run it, it's great. It's good. Well, they completely changed the last encounter. In the last encounter, Not they good. met Belzebub, literally. <laughs> and when they literally meet him, they have killed off the evil dwarves. And he said, well, you know, I don't care that much for dwarves anyway. <laughs> so take the two big eyes as your reward. And he says, what do you want? And they had exactly three minutes, but didn't know the clock was running. And what they needed to say was, I want my ass out of here. Because do you want to spiral your way all the way back? Well, no, hell no, you know. And one of them came up with it. He says, I think we want to go back to Restonford. So Beelzebub sends them to Restonford. They had about 15 seconds left. And if the time limit ran out, he was going to start summoning things. And that would have been the TPK. Yeah, but they, they changed made, it a little bit in this. Yeah. And they changed that. To a, to, to a temple of Beelzebub in this. Right. Yeah. Ooh, he yeah. actually shows up yeah. when I wrote it. For real. Uh -oh. So I did a comparison of A to B, and I got through a pretty fair part of it, and then I realized I'm selling my home and I'm moving. <laughs> so I had to stop that project because I was comparing one to two. Yeah. What happened here and what happened here? What's different? And the number of orcs here and the number of orcs here were different. And this was different and that was different and this was different and that was different. And then here was something that's as I wrote it, oh, well, miracle beyond your wildest dream. But once you got all the way down and around and through the last room, they figured, the editors figured, if Beelzebub actually shows up, he's going to kill every last one. Oh my God, yeah. Especially with the way he set yeah, up. I said, no. He's going to take it as, well, you've killed the dwarves. He didn't care the dwarves. Uh, they were my worshipers. 
they prayed to him, but they're all dead and you've killed them off. So good for you because Beelzebub is lawful after all. And he said, well, you, you've done, you've done your, you've done your job. You've killed them off. Take the two big gems that are worth 550,000 gold pieces each. I think, I think they make take five them. in that. Yeah. Take them and, and tell me what you want. That's awesome. Yeah, I made a minor change to that at the end, Leonard. 179, 178. Uh, that's so funny that you did that. They counted down on them. That's so awesome. That uh, I mean, shoo, that's that's devious. Well, whenever I would have them do a wish, I would give them a certain amount of time. And you have to write it down on a piece of paper. And you can't use any conjunctions. It's got to be 25 words or less. And you have to read it as you wrote it. One shot. You can't improvise once you get out there and actually you. It's what you wrote. Yeah. And I would sit there behind the guy and, and have him read it and go, well, uh, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you wrote it. Now, I wasn't the kind of guy that says, oh, you made this little mistake. I'm going to screw you. I didn't do that. But if you asked if you if your wish was to have five more wishes, I went. Well, that's one wish down. Now, what's your next one? Yeah. Because that that wish was gone. I'm not going to grant that wish. Right. Um, and then I would go by the the 25 words they wrote down, and there were some people who I felt as though underwished. So, I said the power of this wish is worth fifty thousand gold pieces, roughly. 50,000 experience points, roughly. And if you're only asking for 20,000, I'm going to give you 50. You ask for this, I'm going to do better than that. But if you ask for too much, well, you're not going to get it all. You rewarded the meek. I did. I was generous beyond my wildest dreams. <laughs> We're beyond theirs. So, <laughs> I, I want, I, it's it's yeah. like some of those wonderful lines from Back to the Future where... Uh, what, what the hell was his name? Professor, whatever his name is. Uh, he's looking at the thing that... Uh, yes, sir, Christopher Mark, Wright. Um, Manny, Markey, whatever his name was, uh, uh, had done a, a, a video Doc of him Brown. before he got shot. Thank you, guys. And he says, what did I just say? And mm -hmm. it's, of course, him looking at the video of himself. Well, so... 21 gigawatts. I... I I always thought well, uh, Back to the Future, the very first one was just brilliant. Just the second and third were eh, but the first one was just brutal. The third one was especially <laughs> because now you go back to the mid, uh, the, the, the West wild. West. West. Uh, that was crazy. Yeah. So, so Leonard, I, I, you're being very, you're being like too um, generous on. You're not even giving yourself some accomplishments. I just wanted to quickly go over some things, and then we'll get some more questions. Like this module is so fantastic; it's almost an entire campaign setting in itself. L one. There are so many unique things that Leonard created in this that are in the D and D game today. Like, go ahead, Leonard, explain. Some you want of to know some... the rest of the L one story? Yeah, sure, I want to hear it. The Absolutely. Rest of the L one story is Gary gave it to somebody to edit. Mm -hmm. Send it back to me. I called Gary on the phone and said, "This isn't what I wrote." <laughs> so I want you to take it back to where it was. I, I'm sure he had enjoy. He enjoyed pissing all over it. But now I want it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You paid me three thousand five hundred. Now, the person who negotiated the money was Brian Bloom in the good old days where I liked Brian Bloom. Now I would probably throw something in his face, but then I could get arrested. <laughs> Brian was a good D and D player. He was, and when it came to running these tournaments um, that were invitational. Um, Brian would run some of them, and one of them, Gary and he, were the ones who, who did it. And I slipped up on, Gary says, I'm in a bag of holding, and I'm looking out the hole. And I let that go by. That isn't how a bag of holding works. So he got me on it. So out of 24 players, I came in second, not first. Yeah, that's what it says. In the, that's yeah. a mistake. Yep. But you're, you're doing it with, yes, you have your books there, but, and it's, 
their thing that they're doing with uh, their players in your campaign world. I'm allowed to run my campaign, whatever I, whatever thing I'm doing. And what I would do was as soon as they went grapple pummel over there, I'd say, oh, the sword hit stops you from doing it. I didn't give a shit if it hit him or not. You weren't going to grab the pole and overbear me. But I did it using a rule. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so uh, the cell one, uh, the spectator, everyone, is a Leonard creation, right? Ooh. The stone guardian is a Leonard creation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, there's the cover. If you want to know what's on the cover, that's a skelter. It's a, a magical casting um, undead, and there's a zombie or two in here. And mm -hmm. I've never seen them anywhere else but these, this adventure. Correct. Uh, and I've used them. I use them in my game now because of that. So I'm just saying, this is a fantastic adventure. Well, well the, the Stone Guardian and the Spectator are in Monster Manual 2. Yes, they so, are now. Yep. But I don't think the spell casting skeleton yep. zombie are i don't know I, why they're not because they're a fantastic idea yeah. and there's a lot of cool unique items in this thing like this uh um fountain of good health which bubbles up the grove of the the, the uh, uh um uh, almax has i mean there's really great unique th items and the church of the big game is in here too which is a great place to visit. So check this out, everyone. I'm just saying, this is a good place to start with a Leonard well, module. Well, in, in L4 and L5, I've created a bunch of magic items that... All uh, rings. You have a whole set of rings in there. Yeah, absolutely. When I, when I create a bunch of characters, and I will repeat it in four places in um, uh, Facebook, I will always create at least one magic item that to my knowledge, is unique. Now, please understand, there are hundreds of DMs out there. I'm not saying to you that somebody else couldn't have created the exact same thing. God only knows. I mean, I don't know who all these people are, but to my knowledge, I created. But please understand, somebody else could be creating the same thing or something so like it that it looks like I'm pattering myself after them but to my knowledge, I'm not. That's my back door. And I awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark, you haven't asked anything, man. What do you, you want to ask something? No, I've just been enjoying it. Um, <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I, I, do, I do have a question, and, and another, uh, another person online was asking as well. Um, I'd like to start off. What was your inspiration for Liam? Good question. Yeah, you got Icarus, yeah. Yep. I played Liam uh, as a magic user who went through a number of levels and then we picked him up again. And then we picked him up again. So he didn't go from first to 18th level the hard way. I think it was 18th level. I wrote him up somewhere. He's in, uh, I don't know if he's in the Earth Journal. I don't know if he's in, he's in something. If you look up Liam, uh, you can find his history. It's four or five pages of, of schmerz. Um, and I did not in there disclose that. Uh, but the reality of the character is we went from like fifth or sixth level and we skipped ahead in time to ninth or tenth level because like a year went by, the DM came back and said, well, let's keep going. And he said, well, let's, let's assume that all the characters have gone up. I mean, but Lehman goes back to that. I don't even remember who the hell he is. <laughs> did, he have, did you have a style? Did you like to play with him? Was he like brash? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a good guy. Uh, great, great <laughs> whose name I probably forgot. But Lehman came in there, and then we, we had a few other players. So, so where oh, did he live? In did he live in in uh, a tiny hut? Oh. Oh, oh, no, no, no. That's a creation. <laughs> I just had to ask. <laughs> so, Liamman's life, Le Ooh. Leonard? There it is. It's OJ10, Liamman's life. Yep. Beautiful. Green dragon. In. What's the, uh, what's the uh, parent document? Or is it's, it? uh, 
Earth Journal 10. Ah, okay. All right, so th that's in there. And I wrote that up. Awesome. Uh, some of it I had to write. Now, when I just did this um, history that I sent you guys, which was the history of uh, the Sulis, yeah. I have placed people in there who were characters in L1, 2, and 3 as player characters. Right. Now, I know who they are. No one else knows who they are. So if they look at the history, they'll say, oh, wait a minute. That's my fighter. Oh, wait a minute. That's my clerk. And I took the name and placed it in the Sewell history just for the sake of, let me grab a few names from players that I played with as their tribute to their character. What I actually put in uh, was not necessarily the exact, it's just a namesake. So all Burke in my actual campaign ended up being a seventh, eighth or ninth level fighter, but in the history, he's something altogether different. It's just somebody who's a namesake. I did that to say, here, if you read this over, you're going to see your character. Like Dobfer's in there. Dobfer is a ninth level cleric that I played that, um, you know, Nystal is a real family, right? N-Y-S-T-U-L. Uh, Brad Nystal and Jenny Nystal had two boys, uh, Mike Nystal and Brian. And Mike worked for a few different companies doing other things with role play. Um, but Jenny uh, played Dobfer all the way through to ninth level. Now, I snuck him in the back door of when I wrote the Sewell Pantheon. If you read for Tubo, at the very end, it says Dobfer is a ninth level high priest, the one and only that's allowed within Fortubo's pantheon only one at a time. And he made it. Wow. Wow. So it's pronounced yeah. Nystal, not Nistal, because we always did Nistal. So yeah. we were yeah. wrong there too. Nystal. I knew, so I knew, I like knew to... how to pronounce his name. So it was Nystal. So then I'd like to ask what Brad, how do you Brad, I think pronounce but... Ayus. Ayus or Piaz <laughs> <He> or... <laughs> I'd like, I'd like to know. I mean, since he was there at, at the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Brad and his family were in my game, and we added a few people. We added um, some kid who brought his girlfriend. And, oh, what a mistake that was. She had the faintest idea. All she wanted to do was sit there and make goo-goo eyes at her boyfriend. But we had to let her play a character, and it was awful. It was just oh. <laughs> Nice, nice girl, but she didn't understand the game at all. But she got to sit there and put her hand on his on his lap. You know, uh, you know. <laughs> don't take it, don't take it beyond that. Just on his, just on his, on his leg. Um, and what they did, the privacy of their own home is up to them. So it uh, is level six. I need to be. Over the river and through the woods. I got we got a question out there uh, okay, that I'd like you to. This is kind of like, um, I don't know how to how to put this. Uh, the, the, with the resurgence of D and D nowadays, I mean, mm -hmm. I, you, I know you're an old school like like me. Um, do you have see any benefit to uh, you know uh, for what the resurgence is now with the five E and you see or or are you still like. With, with me I, way in the old days. I, in the I golden just age. had some, I, I did not buy it, nor, well, I don't know, do I intend to? Uh, I'm, I'm retired, I've got time. I, I might buy a fifth edition player's handbook. Okay. Although, um, do you know Christopher Lahr? I do not, I don't know if anyone. Chris Lahr and Lars Clark and two other guys run CAFCON in North Carolina, I think. Oh, so that was the uh, module you wrote for that. Right. Too. Okay. Yes. I, I, I wrote 
I wrote a mod the year before last and one this year. And uh, the one this year is I got it right here. with the uh, Ravages of the Mind. The town of Leahkeel, okay. which is now uh, uh, Anna was kind enough to draw a map showing where Leahkeel is. And now I'm getting ready to it's being um, edited by someone. And once it's out there, I'm going to I think it's going to go in not Earth Journal, the other thing. Uh, dragon's foot dragon uh, dragon tooth okay. hand foot one of them there was a dragon tooth too that was people who made miniatures wasn't it i believe right. so back way back in the yep back in the day was somebody who did, who, yeah, who, did, who did miniature gloppy miniature but miniature <laughs> this uh this ravages of the mind is pretty disturbing leonard has got the guy good and seen <laughs> Oh, it, <laughs> it's disturbing. <laughs> so, um, well, he went, he went nuts because his wife and child were killed. So he ended up worshiping what a devil or a demon, whatever I said. Uh, well, it's a rock. So, the, the, demon, the, yeah. Uh, the demon gave him a rock to play with. And um, so it's a demon. And he was a worshiper of Lur. And he was a cleric of Lur. But the, the temple got attacked and a lot of people died, including this guy's wife and daughter. And finally, he decides to go into town where he hasn't been for months and months. What he would do is he would sneak in with a wagon every now and then, buy some supplies and leave. And this time he decides, I'm going to go to the tavern and have a bottle of good wine. I'm tired of buying the swill that I buy every now and then. And he sees this woman who vaguely resembles his wife. That and matter. he goes, ah, oh, my wife. And then the kid walks up, ah, oh, my kid. Well, of course, he's nuts. It's a, it's a he, he's over the river and through the woods at this point. <laughs> so the next day, he kidnaps them and runs back to the ruins of the Temple of Lur. And now we have to go rescue the two people and preferably bring him to justice. Now, my understanding is, and I can't get the details out of the guy who ran it, and I'm probing every way I possibly can to get the absolute detail of how many things did they fight? What did they fight? Right. Did they fight the rock? Did they not fight the rock? Did they fight the guy who stole the the two people. Well, they're levels three through five, so... Yeah. You know, if they went down the right hole in the right room, they would discover the woman and the child, which, as best I can tell, that's what they did. So, yes, they rescued them, which was one of the primary things they were supposed to do, but I don't think they went after him at all. And I don't know how many things they fought. I'm well, trying to find that out. To going to your new thing, the, an iron skeleton's in here. New monster, new magic item, ring of iron skeleton control. Uh, mm -hmm. Leonard, do I have your permission, if anyone online who would want this, to give this to them? Not to, yet. DM, not yet. Okay. All right. Okay. The, the re here's why. Okay. If I can find out they fought almost none of it, then... I want the scenario where he gets on his wagon, goes back to town, and re-kidnaps the two people. Okay. Okay. <laughs> because Got you know what you're gonna you, okay. you realize what the town is gonna do. They're gonna okay. say, Oh, it's wonderful, you're back, you're back. Now go back to waiting tables. Cool. <laughs> so what I would then create is a scenario where he kidnaps them again, but he goes somewhere else with them. But I can't do that if various pieces have been fought. Now I have to create something new for um, May of 2020 is when you're going to run the next. Okay, I'll just I'll hold hold on to that in the in the file. Uh, so uh, was G Guy Gas in that article with Leamond? Was that a joke? Basically, you put in there. I got a question on that. Uh, uh, mentions of someone impersonating Liam and named Guy Gas. Um, yeah, was it? An oh, yeah, that's a play on his on his name. Okay. I, 
In which one? Uh, in, one? in the article um, that uh, Brian showed, right? Brian? Yeah, the, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I guess, yeah. Okay. Now, I, I don't remember what I said he did, but whatever it was, he did you just it was basically a spoof of uh, of 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 of, of Gygax was yes. to honor him okay well well in in there uh Leoman actually meets Lendor um okay. i wrote that up in that way um hmm. so they, they've got Leoman in some group of nine mages or seven mages or whatever it is, some circle, little group. circle of eight. Yeah, circle of eight. Well, I had nothing to do with that at all. So somebody grabbed William and, and threw him into the circle, whether he liked it or not. Uh, but you know, once Gygax lost the company, I lost the ability to say, "Hey, wait a minute, that's mine." Right, right, right. I had that ability at one point. Right. But then, when the, the when the Bloom brothers sold the company out from under it, well, it's a long story. Um, uh, supposedly, I wasn't there. The, the judge is listening to the to the, to the stuff, and, and he says, "You've done a lot of duplicitous things." He says to the Blooms and this woman, whatever her name is. But he says, "Unfortunately, he didn't break the law." So. The deal is supposed to be something along this line. They offered to sell him their shares, but at a price they named. And he didn't have enough money to do it. So therefore, they won and he got kicked out. Yeah. As opposed to him being able to um, yeah, uh, 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 yeah. honor his, um, what's written into the contract. They had the right to ask him to buy the shares when he couldn't, not because he didn't want to, but he couldn't raise enough money fast enough. So that's now I'm telling you a bunch of secondhand stuff. Right. Okay. It's okay. I don't have this out of Guy Gax's mouth, but my understanding is that's what happened. I think Guy Gax's second wife told me. I met her once. Not Mary. Mary is. Luke's. You're talking about Gail. Gail. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that his second one? Yes. Yes. Um, cool. But Luke is Mary's son, as I understand. I think. Alex is the son of Gail. Uh, Luke, Ernie, Elise. Um, I can't name all the guys. Oh, there, yeah, there, there are are four very attractive red-headed girls of various ages, and Ernie. And then Luke came along later. I'm relatively sure the, the point count is six kids. Could be five. Don't know. So Anna, Brian, Mark, what else you got to ask Leonard here? I mean, he we're we're rolling through. I told you Leonard this would blow by real quick, man. Oh yeah, this is. I, I, I yeah, knew I that this time would just fly and, by. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have a quick question about pronunciation because you've given Ooh. us some. Ouija. Ouija is different for me because that we totally got that one wrong. Yeah. Uh, how do you say? Uh, is it Noribo? Noribo. Nariba, okay. Lendor, Cord, Cyrule or Cyrule? Cyrule. 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 Okay. Even though Cyrule. it's spelled S Y R U L, I think. That's why. I think someone. Yeah. Uh, S Y R U L. But I pronounce it Cyrule. Cyrule. Lurg. Lurg. Um, Falcon. Lurg, Nariba, Cord, Falcon, Cyrule, Fortubo, Ouija. Pyremus, Beltar, Lurg, Lurg twice? No. Lurg, Phyton, Zerbo, Osprim, Lydia, Braum, Braum, and Jaskar. And Jaskar. Okay. Nice. And, and Aquan. Aquaman. Aquaman. And, and Aquaman. Mon, right. who wins? So that way I don't get sued. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, you know that when he wrote the, the fantasy supplement, it was Tolkien character. He had a Belrog in there. He had a Hobbit. Oh yeah, yeah. 
and the studio sued him to cease and desist order. But the studio wanted to uh, uh, copyright the, the, the word elf and dwarf. He said, no, you can't quite pull that one off since that goes back thousands of years, elves and dwarves. Fire said, art. Please, yeah. copyright that. But, you know, a lawyer will take everything they can possibly get. But yeah, so the bell rock had to be named something else. And, of course, the Baylor, I think it was, the, yeah. The, the, the Hobbit became the half. Treant. <laughs> Treant became the, yep. uh, yes, Ant became the Treant. So, you know, he snuck it in through the back door, but he had to call it something else. So can you settle for us? Did you hear Gary pronounce Ayus or Eus or however? What, uh, I use. I use. I use. Okay. I have an open blow about a, a, a boil and I now ooze. I ooze. I think. Ah. I think that's the I ooze. I As ooze. if it were the letter I and then O O Z E. Wow. I ooze. That's how it came about. Yeah, I think so. Wow. Remember, that's him. That's his pronunciation. Right. I think then, that's right. That's then, I have to, okay. that's an Ernie and Luke question because yeah. they played in the campaign. So they could easily veto what I'm telling you. Well, we'll, we'll ask him at Gary Khan. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, sure Leonard, we didn't even touch on this, uh, the, your articles in Dragon and, and stuff. Yes, I, won't go over exactly. I won't go over details because I, I, I don't want to. Uh, overwhelm you with just detail oriented stuff, but the Archer and the Deathmaster, like two of our favorite, a favorite PC class of ours and a favorite NPC class of ours. So, could you just go over your inspiration for both a little bit? Like, you, you do realize I'm rewriting the Archer, and that's going to be yes. In, I think it's going to be in Footprints. Okay. And the rewrite is mainly aimed at the Archer Ranger. Because yep. that's where I decided that the experience points didn't work really well. So that was the main rewrite. And all I did with it, my inspiration for the Archer is Earl Flynn and Robin. Okay. Okay. Now, you watched him fire arrow after arrow after arrow after arrow after arrow with deadly accuracy. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Watched him split the arrow. Remember that one? wonderful gizmo? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, how the hell do you get to do that? And if you just leave him as a guy who's got a bow in his hand, he's never going to be able to do that. So you have to have point blank. I also smear, uh, smeared out the, uh, the ranges. So I said you have from, you have uh, from 1,000... Wait, 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 let me think. I think you got that 600, so 620. I, what I did was yeah. I said, there's a place where you're minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, and minus five, not just minus two and minus oh, five. Oh, okay. So that's good for medium to long. You spread it right. out. Yeah, you do. I you do in the out. prelude. You do in that. Right. Yeah, and, then, and then I do the. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. The, the, the uh, sh short range. In detail, what I try call point blank, and we use that to this day. We have a point blank range for archers, and you know, and, and archers the only ones in our campaign can fire three hours around at seventh. No other class can, so uh, you know, we give archers spe that special. Uh, we have a question from the audience about why you gave archers some limited spell casting ability at higher levels. Why would you, you know, like you gave them? They have shield, magic missile, uh, flame Ready? arrow. Ready? Yep. I felt like. <laughs> there you go, Bill. Bill, there's your answer. No, hey, that's a good, great answer to a question, and that's that's the only reason. Well, we did. Now, now, you know, the Archer Ranger had the ability to yeah. cast, and you had the Ranger had the ability to cast. So. Yeah. So I thought, if the Archer Ranger can cast spell, we know that'll be true. Why can't we take the Archer? And at some point, give him okay. something, and give him things that are kind of related to protecting himself, like shield. That's um, awesome. <laughs> well, you, you you just you do it because at the time you think this is a good idea, so let me do it. And uh, not, not, 
I don't have nightmares and write them down when I wake up. <laughs> it's a great answer and uh, an inspiration for the Death Master, which I found something out about that, but I'll tell that uh, a little bit later. I just thought that you should have some poor schlock who has this fascination with death. Now, as an aside, Ouija, mm -hmm. Ouija is there to protect the dead. Not she has command that. over undead, but her priests will almost never raise anybody from the dead. Because the point is, once you're dead, they're under her protection. Not that they will never do it, but boy, you really have to vindicate the hell out before a cleric of Ouija will raise someone from the dead. That's like, you know, saying your mother sleeps with pig. It's right up there with that. Awesome. And you just wanted you just wanted a nasty, nasty, dead oh, he's uh, guy. He's, he's reasonably nasty. He, yeah. Oh, yeah. He has, he has this, this little... I used one recently. Culture. Yep. Well, the, 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 the part of him that's fun is where you mix up the, uh, the potion, I think. And if he takes the potion and he fails a certain saving throw, he dies and it's all over. Yeah. Now, I did something akin to that recently. Uh, yeah, that's about that's creating a lich with a special potion, and then if you fail that, you're done. I guess they do it with well, the Death Master, too. Uh, is there something in the Death Master? Maybe there isn't. I haven't read the Death Master in years. It's okay. All I did was say it can't be a player character because all of the prelude leading you up to actually being able to animate things and do stuff uh, is tedious crap. Yeah. Uh, and what player character in their right mind would want to do all this tedious crap? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know. Um, it's so, right up there with the anti paladin with us as far as NPC classes, uh, and I, we love yeah. both. Well, you so. could you could spell the anti pillar the A U N T I E, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Oh, the anti pillar that is gay. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Leonard, you're allowed to say that. Yep. That's awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why. <wide. laughs> and any anything for Leonard? Well, uh, about Lender, must, about Lender Isle, yeah, or I must. Yeah, it, it's it's so interesting because I. There is a lot of detailed mapping of the Lendor Isles, but not much what the terrain actually looks like. Is it a temperate, subtropical kind of, what kind of, of islands? They're, they're almost down in the subtropical kind of, but the temperate zone. So. I, I thought somewhere. Yeah. I did the. Um, that was one weather. of the questions I wanted to ask you. I, yeah. the, I thought I did the weather somewhere. Now, where did I do it? Um, because I think what I took into account was the tides would create something unusual. But that would be something I would have to... Because now, like when I just did uh, the, this town in Raddick, I created a... Um, high and low temperature rainfall thing mm -hmm. for the town. And I did something like that for Lendor I long ago. Now, where it is... It's in the glossography that is in the, in the box set. There's a oh, weather generation one, table. That's the one Gary did. on a. He's talking about the one he wrote up for his Oh, okay. Game. Yeah, you did one separate. Yeah. I think so. Um, as to, I'll look. Yep. I'll look. Excellent. Awesome. But remember, between now and August 9th, it's unlikely. And between August 9th and August It's, it's Gen 16th, Con. So, 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 yeah, oh, Gen so, Con. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gone. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, well, I'm not going to Gen Con. I'm going to... Uh, to uh, um, uh, now I want to go not go to Gen Con. To go and listen to five operas. Oh, doing that for this is the eleventh or twelfth year. Wow, That's they awesome. uh, they run five operas in the season, and there's two weeks out of the season where they do a different opera each night. 
So you can see all five operas from the season, one on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then you get to see on Saturday, if you stay for Saturday, The Apprentices do stuff. The oh. people who are apprenticing to be opera singers. Nice. The, oh, uh, awesome. the um, Santa Fe Opera is considered world class, quote unquote. It's a, a major opera. Eleven years you've been doing that. That's really uh, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Knowing that yeah. you're doing it every year. It's, it's it's very interesting place. Beautiful. Santa yeah. Fe is beautiful. Yeah. So, I have to go. Leonard. Leonard. This was see look at the Thanks. timing. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. This is fantastic. It was great. It was fantastic. Thank you for really um wow. hanging in there with this. <laughs> if you get more questions, okay. send them to me. Tell them it's not gonna happen right away. No, it's not a problem. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, your question. maybe we'll have you on six months, nine months down the road, and we'll talk about some other topics. Or oh, God, I'm gonna live that. Long. Oh, you'll be around. <laughs> a lot of times, you're gonna love this one. I will go to a movie and see a preview and say, "Well, now I gotta live long enough to see that." Mm. Yeah, well, it, we all have bucket lists, right? And my, really? I've never been to yeah. Gen Con in my life. And, uh, you know. I, I, I piss in my bucket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, really, thank you. Thank you for coming on. I know, you know, we bounced around a lot and we got, we, we picked your brain on some things. Uh, thanks. Uh, this was, uh, by far, this is our largest show ever. Oh, by so far. After I get back from vacation, if we want to do this again. Excellent. I, I'm all for it. Absolutely. We can always come I, on and we yep. can talk about specific topics if you'd like or something yep. that uh, something you're working on. We could we could do that definitely. Anything you want to ask. Great. Well Perfect. we're we're yeah. gonna hold on yeah. here for a couple don't, more minutes. Don't expect don't expect five thousand words from me because <laughs> <laughs> well, th- yeah, this was great. So I, I really yeah, thank, you, thank you so much, Leonard, for answering our questions. And yep. it was, it was so the, the at, next thing is going to be Leia Keel. Yeah. And then I'm also going to produce the um, episode that they've done, but I can't do that until I find out what the DM for this year's module, how far he goes. Because until I find out if I'm going to dovetail if I'm going to recapture the people right. that they found, if that's off the table because of they fought this and killed that, then I can't do that. But if they just got lucky and went down the right hole, that's literally what's involved. Right. There's a place in one room where there's a, a, a door, a, a trap door covered by rubble. And if they somehow went in there, removed the rubble, went down, and there she is against the wall. <gasps> And the kid is right next door. So all I have to do is take her, go up the ladder and leave. Now, that does technically complete the primary reason for going. The important secondary reason is to capture this schmuck because, after all, he stole people and he kidnapped people. So he's there's something wrong. He's obviously delusional. So he should go behind bars somewhere. People know that he lived in the ruins of Lurd's place. Now, here's another fun thing. One of his things is he can turn into a werebear, an evil werebear. And guess what Lurd can do? He can turn into a Lurg can yeah. take command of any werebear. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. So if... The bad guys bring in the devil, I bring in Lurg. And Lurg says, you're through, stop moving, don't turn back into a human, I'll get back to you in a week. And Lurg is going to beat the shit out of his team. Well, that sounds like a fun sequel. Doesn't that? Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. sounds like an awesome. I, I, I have a vivid imagination. It's, that is what now my vivid imagination is leaving you. Wow. Thank you so much, Leonard. I mean, thank really, you so much. It was wonderful. Not, yeah. And not just for tonight, 
Oh, oh it's okay. Yeah. Well, hey, but look, anyway, look. Not just for tonight, but obviously for having your hand in something. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. We, uh, this was, this is fantastic. I, I mean, I couldn't ask, he, two hours, plus he was on at seven. So we hung in, we hung in there for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah. um, thank you all, but we're going to, Brian, what do you got going on, man? You got anything exciting going on you want to discuss? We'll, we'll do some quick um, announcements right. and call it an evening. Yeah. What do you uh, got? the, the main thing is, uh, uh, cannon fire, the Facebook group is still going strong. Oh, yeah. uh, a lot of great content generated by the users. Uh, I also run the Discord server along with uh, Christoph for Greyhawk Online. And Christoph has a lot of stuff going on. OS Journal 29 just came out. It's brilliant. If you haven't seen that, go get it. Yes. Uh, I wrote a brief PC rundown for my brand new Salt Marsh campaign that's in there. And you have stuff in there, Jay. I mean, there's, just a, there's a lot of good stuff going on out there. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of heraldry lately. I've uh, been pretty busy. Altamira, and, yeah. Altamira, Altamira, Altamira. We got to work on that. And I yep. need to, and Carlos, you need to get in touch with me. I sent you my contact info. You wanted to do something. Um, anyway. Yep. So, yeah, that's pretty much where it's at. I'm, I'm running basically my first Greyhawk campaign in forever. And I've got three players and an NPC. And we're going to see how that goes. That's awesome. Uh, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> just say that it's a interesting crew of characters uh, i'm curious to see how this is going to go but and, it's, exciting. Uh, it's exciting it's super exciting yeah. I'm, I'm i'm really jazzed about that and i'm playing DD in another home campaign you know someone else's homebrew world which is a lot of fun and you know that's the main thing i gotta say is go out and play people you know Get a game going. If it's online, great with Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds. If it's in person, great. Even better in my eyes. Go play d and I don't yep. care what edition it is. Just go have some fun. I am. All right. Awesome. Anna, I yeah. mean, we'll be seeing you at Gen Con. What, what, yes, what, yeah, what, what I'm preparing you? for for Gen Con, uh, wrapping up for my seminar that's coming up, and and a bunch of other stuff that I need to have done. So it's basically Gen Con, Gen Con, Gen, Gen Con for the next week or so. I leave in next Tuesday. So so and the the um, but I have another a bunch of projects that when I come back home from Gen Con, and one of them is Lindor Isles. So I will be in touch with Leonard and 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 we have to go over and, and see if we can get the terrain right and start writing games. So I'm going to read all his adventures one more time. I've read them twice. Now I'm going to read them a third time and see if I can squeeze everything in there. And and then we have a bunch of corrections. We can see if we can make a all the, his the corrections and make a version that is is uh, Leonard Lakofka approved. That is awesome. And yep. uh, what what time is your uh, uh, seminar? Uh, at it's Jane? on Saturday between three and five. Unfortunately, I think it's already booked full. It was booked full even before I knew when it was supposed to be. So so uh, I say I'm so sorry for that. So so yeah. So when I knew the time they were going to be there, all well, tickets were already sold. So hopefully we can squeeze some extra yeah. people in there. But we'll see. I never thought I could fill fill a seminar like like that that's that, yeah, just, that just speaks so much for your talents anna yeah Thank absolutely yep. and uh, uh that is uh i'm looking forward to try i gotta get i'm actually dming at the greyhawk house from 9 a.m to 2 p.m so i'm gonna be running from there and trying to get it over there and i'm assuming mark's gonna be with me so uh but we'll we'll talk about that and get cool. into yep. getting yeah and then trying to sneak in the back door yep. <laughs> yeah, and, and also I will be uh, doing yeah, Gen Con for people who want to, to come up and, and say hi and, and talk about maps. I will A lot of the time I will be in the Lone Wolf development booth. I think I it's 345 or 348. It's in the 300s. Lone Wolf development. Yeah, the, the people that, about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I will be there a lot of the time, probably about four or five hours a day. So, so that's the, the best way to find me is to, to go and, and look up. And, and if I'm not there, ask them when my shifts are. Then that's the easiest way to find me. Sounds Otherwise, boring. I will be out talking to friends and colleagues and, and, and doing stuff all over the con for, for the four days. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic, Anna. Thank you. And yep. Mark. Oh, uh, so for my group, so we're, we're not playing, obviously, this week. Uh, the intent is is that we're going to be playing um, after we get back from Gen Con. And no, the Monday before Gen Con. Or the, I'm sorry, my apologies, Monday before Gen Con. Um, and um, so we have all of the maintenance pieces taken up. We're going to continue with the 
uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen. Mm -hmm. And uh, they actually just got rid of uh, one of the main nemesis that is early on in the campaign. Uh, well, typic not typical Wayne rule where we've gone through every room. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that on Monday almost, night. Almost by accident, how to get to the main, the main spot. But uh, for those that didn't have the opportunity to watch, they just encountered the room where some dragon eggs are seen. Yeah, pretty so, cool. Hey, uh, Mark, did you hear that they are going to re-release the, the the whole Team at Original Adventure series yep. in a, a single volume? Oh, new cover okay. with a bunch of fixes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, mine's, it, 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 mine's adapted anyway for yeah, Woody. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was announced on EN World the other night. That's so, cool. Oh. Yeah. Check Just, yeah, check it out. Now, I want to say something real important about Mark's game, and Mark plays every other Monday. The timing is very impeccable. Mark will be the last broadcast we will have before Gen Con, okay? Whatever that Thursday, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Monday, the end of the month is that date. Uh, someone can look that up for me. Uh, that day is the last broadcast we'll have while I'm off at Gen Con. That's uh, the 29th. 29th, okay? yes. So there'll be no Thursday. You know, there's a Thursday one-nighter this week. That's our next broadcast, Thursday the 25th. It's called Eviction. Okay, and it's a one-nighter. It's with a group, the Windborn, out of Altamira, and it's in the county of Ulick. You can all figure out what that's all about with the name Eviction. So that'll be... Uh, and then we'll, next Sunday, we're going to do, and this is Mark's idea, uh, Gabin 56, Organizations and Adventuring Parties. We're going to talk about all the really offbeat groups and organizations we have in our campaign, maybe in published sources, uh, like, uh, for example, um, the Saloonian and Sus Forest Watch, which doesn't exist anywhere else, or Spunk which really doesn't exist anywhere else that we're probably not, Mark, right? Or the Free Reavers, we need to talk about them. We're going to talk about a lot of these groups and, Ooh, and then talk about yeah. some of our 19 adventuring groups and mix them all in uh, and have that discussion. Uh, and that was Mark's idea. And that'll be, that'll be uh, the last Gabin. And then I'm off that Thursday. And then I leave Sunday morning early at Gen Con. And just like I did with PAX last year, uh, and Brian, had, you know, kind of, you said, no, that was a great episode. I'm going to do my experiences at Gen Con that Sunday night when I get back. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, hopefully I get back in time. <laughs> if I don't, I'm going to do it the day after on a Monday night, but I'm going to do it, try to get it done that Sunday night, uh, get home and, you know, say hi to the wife and go upstairs and get that all compiled. Um, so, um. I, absolutely, Mark, yes. Um, I, I'll try and get that done. Now, the week after, we're on, but the week after that, like the 10th through the 15th, I'm on vacation, and I, I'm saying it's very timely. Mark's group, again, will be the only game that week, and I'm looking at August 12th. So August 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, I'm done a show with my family, So uh, I, and I won't have a... Um, I won't have a Gabin on that Sunday. I'll be down the shore. Mark's game will be the only show in town on this channel that week. So it's kind of, uh, guys, it'll be on the schedule. Schedule's up all the way set, all the way through, like, the 18th of August. And then we get back to the Temple of Erethnol on August 22nd. So that's what we got going on. Now, the big, big thing of all, next Saturday night is a Saturday night special. Okay? Every six to eight weeks, I run a, a game on Saturday night. I am not DMing on Saturday night. We have a special guest DM who is one of my original DMs when I was a kid. The ever mysterious Tim will be DMing his Ooh. city state of the Invincible Overlord campaign, yep. which we have not played in 25 years. Wow. I have two. I have two characters in it. Yes. Yay, Jay's not DMing. I'm playing Dervilia Tadius, <laughs> a 13th level Cavalier, and Kixana Wortley. He's a Lord Gazumba poor man's version, a fighter clerk mage. Mark has a high level, 12th level Druid, Greenleaf, oh, oh, and yep. a fighter mage, Penul. And then there's two other NPCs. And, uh, you know, uh, that'll be from 7 o'clock on to wherever we're done. It's going to be a one-shotter, obviously. When, but I'm trying to convince Tim to run something every six months. So, uh, and let me tell you something. You think I'm a jerk with DMing? <laughs> Tim's, <laughs> Tim's, Tim is very deceptive in what's right in front of you. That kind of, he's great. It's a great, great, fun time. Yep. Uh, and that'll be, that'll be streamed. 
uh, next Saturday night. That'll give us some little extra content. I'm really excited about it. Tim, it's going to be at my place, so we're going to have the tabletop. Tim, I have this custom. Um, let me show you uh, this real quick. Hopefully, I can pop this up real quick. Bill, uh, the master crafter, is working on a new piece of. I had uh, I found a chariot that she she uses, and he is is crafting this. Where do you see this? All right, here we go. There it is. Okay, there's the chair. There, it's not finished yet, but there you go. Ooh. That's what Bill's working on. Yeah, look at that. It's beautiful. So um, that will be uh, that will be completed hopefully for this. Um, yeah, so it can fit two figures. Yeah, it's nice. So um, and he built the base for it and everything. So I know it's not done, Bill. I know it's not done, but it's come on, it's getting there. It's getting. You're, it, you're not done. It's better than my finished. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, this is not a Reaper Mini. This is by a company that I I've been searching for this um, uh, thing for ages, and I found it because it was the right size for what we needed. So it's not by one of our sponsors, but there is uh, uh, Greyhawk Mike just got on, and Leonard's already gone. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> Leonard, Leonard is off now. Now, how do I get this off here? I got to remove. Hopefully, I don't remove the wrong thing. But yeah, so that's uh, that's for next week as well, and we'll do full terrain, full figure style. Tim, uh, Tim's a one E guy, just like I am, with some two E thrown in. A couple different rules in me, but it doesn't matter, you know. And we're we're, we're doing heavy <laughs> rage quits. That's funny. Yeah, Harley minis. You yes, missed go ahead. everything, Mike. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I have two more things to <laughs> to, to to add. Uh, one is that Mike uh, just came into chat. We uh, Mike and me will we will do a new Legends and Lore on Wednesday Excellent. on the Greyhawk uh, channel and on uh, eight o'clock Eastern, eight p.m. Eastern. Uh, we haven't decided yet. We have okay. two possible guests that might come on. Oh, Not, cool. Len Lakofka, but uh, <laughs> not yet. We'll see if we can we can snag him. But we have two possible guests. We, I can't say any names because last week we did, and, and he kind of fell through. So so we have to see if possible. Otherwise, well, we I know a, it's not me. So yeah. exactly, we, 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 you you on the kind of we have to kind of get in and, and talk some heraldry. But one topic we talked about last time that was last week. One of the many things we touched were were food and drinks from Greyhawk, and everyone went wild. And so that would be if nothing else that. That's the one we should should go, That's but I cool I kind of burned my my beer types and and wine sorts and stuff. So, but that that was one that was kind of fun last time. And one more thing is that sure. uh, just okay. before I leave uh, for Gen Con, I will release the realm maps. My Flannies maps cut into 150 pieces will go for life for everyone. A player version awesome. and a DM version. They're hexed and non hexed, both player and DM. So you have four oh, different fantastic. ones you can play with. Yeah. Nice. So every forest, every highland, every every country every ocean lakes and stuff like that split up in in highly compressed jpeg so they're simple to use on websites and and stuff like that in various tools if you have campaign managers and stuff like that so so that's coming you know, just before i leave for for gen con i release it for everybody my patrons Brilliant. have had it for like almost a month now but it's coming for everyone oh yeah. i do oh, go ahead, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. No, sure. that, go ahead. I, I do have one other thing i did I was inspired by Leonard because I was researching the Sulawese Pantheon to <laughs> do this interview with you guys. And I wrote my version of a creation story <laughs> for uh, Oerth. Or Oerth. Oh, yes. And I, I published that. Super uh, cool. I, I published that on uh, Cannon Fire Facebook and I published it on the Greyhawk Discord. Uh, I'm still working on that. You know, it's it's literally a couple lines with a bunch of footnotes, and it's to me it was like one of those really tight, nice pieces that I was able to do, and it made it's sense cool. to me. Yeah, it's super so, cool. Yeah, I am anyway. uh, doing. I'm doing one more thing here. Um, I am going to. Uh, we should do this on every show. If you are not, if you are uh, um, a casual watcher to this. You really should join the Cannon Fire, uh, our, I'm sorry, the Greyhawk Online Discord. Um, I'm trying to put it up again, and this freaking Facebook thing's taking forever. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I, got, I, I always does. Uh, you know, I should have just left the link down on the, I can't even copy and paste right now. I, oh, my gosh. So, um, 
I'll get that up after, or if Brian can do it, or if Anna, you can do it. So yeah, there, we have a Discord, yep. and uh, please uh, use it because there's always Greyhawk discussion going on there. It's really good discussion. Um, there's uh, I have my own uh, my own sub channel, so it is Will from Return to the Bandit Kingdoms. I finally got it here. Copy paste. So uh, you know, please please take a look, check it out. That's our Discord. So thank you all. We got four shows coming up before Gen Con uh, on our channel uh, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday coming up, and then uh, then we'll be off till the next Sunday. So uh, enjoy all the content. Thank you all so very much for for, for this was a great show. I, I I hope you all thought it was as I mean I know uh, Leonard Leonard's rambles on with stuff, but that's part of his charm. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, uh, and the storytelling and he. Uh, I found out some things I did not know when we uh, started tonight. I, I had no idea how they came up with Ayus. Is I never heard that story ever anywhere else. I yeah. I never heard it. I mean, it's that, awesome. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a, that was a great one. Thanks, Frank. Thank you all for making the, the channel so successful. Really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna hit up with uh, we're gonna hit up with some of our ads here, and uh, maybe we'll be chatting all, all of us in the background here. So uh, thanks, guys. See you Thursday night for. Uh, Eviction. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. We'll do Reaper again first, and we'll go to NBA because we like rock and roll music. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool. And banging music. Come on. Yeah. Therefore. Well, congratulations on getting that sponsor. Uh, that, yeah, and Brian, they came to us, man. Uh, I did. I we were, Yeah, they actually. Um, approached us, which was really cool. So, uh, no, it's it's a great get, and it seems perfect for your show. Yeah, thank you, thank you, man. Um, and we have our we got our first uh, shipment from them, and Bill uh, uh, Sashar Scorn is painting up stuff as we speak <laughs> with all the other things he's got going on. Uh, you know, because we want to highlight a lot of the stuff that they uh, are so kind to uh, allow us to uh, to get. Uh, some is some this character a phone thing or is this no some... no he, they gave us a lot they gave us an amount that we could just get whatever we wanted <laughs> so wow. we, yes yes uh, so to, you filled in some things I'm assuming yeah yeah I'll talk to I'll talk to you all fair about that <laughs> but uh, we got yeah. um we got the um they got a uh, uh, like a mausoleum and three uh, multiple pieces that uh, he's putting together. We got that. We got uh, that's a bones, but we got a lot of metal minis for player characters, particularly for Tom who needed some new player characters. We got a lot of spell effects, um, like they they got some smaller walls of fire. We got we got some unpainted monsters, like green slimes, you know, things that we needed. Yeah, you're right, fillers. They stuff we could use for our campaign, which is cool. And uh, I still, we still have the credits still. So. I um, still love my little pug familiars from one of the familiar packs. Oh, cool. Yeah, we, we had a pair of pugs, Boris and Natasha. So we, as soon as my wife and I saw that there were pugs in the familiar packs, we bought two of them so we had a pair. Nice. <laughs> nice. We hey, got a lot of plastics. We'll see you guys later. All right, Mark, I'll talk to you soon. Mark, great yep. to see you. Bye, Bye Mark. Yeah. Everyone we'll have a great night. Week. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to you all soon. Um, have a good one. Thanks. Thank you.